Well, I want to tell you about some numbers. We'll start with two and go on to eight, pass by 7776 and come finally to 3264. We have a tour to make. So how about two? First of all, this is a story about conics. Conics are curves in the plane that are very familiar to students in high school already. If I have y equals x squared and I graph that, it looks something like this. That's a parabola. Parabolas are important in all sorts of ways, but they were also studied along with the other so-called conic sections by the Greeks already for a long time and were a big subject in the 19th century geometry. So-called conic sections because you can get all of them by slicing a cone. If you slice it right across straight, you get a circle. If you tilt your slice a little bit, you get an ellipse. And if you slice it, you get a parabola. Tilt it a little more, just parallel to the center, you get part of a hyperbola. If you think of the cone going both ways, you get both parts of the hyperbola. In the 19th century, people began to think about these in a different way. Uh, they're given all of them by quadratic equations. So here's an equation which is quadratic, it has degree 2, an exponent of 2, and nothing higher. And of course, a circle can be written as x squared plus y squared equals 1, for example. Ellipse, if you put a, an x coefficient in front of the x, you might get an ellipse. Hyperbola is x times y equals 1. So all of these are quadratic equations. They have a term of degree 2. All quadratic equations give conics. If you really include all of them, then you get funny things that you might not think of as conics at first. For example, if you just take x squared equals 0, what does that look like? Well, here's x equals 0, and x equals 0 is the y-axis. x squared equals 0 is sort of twice the y-axis, and that will play an important part in our story. Anyway, those are conics. They're degree 2 things for a different reason as well. So. Uh, one way that mathematicians measure the degree of these things, or of other curves, is to draw a straight line and see how many times it meets them. So let's try that with a circle. So we agree that a circle is degree 2. It's given by a degree 2 equation. We drew it. If I draw this straight line, it obviously meets it in two points. You might object that, well, I cheated a little bit because I didn't draw this line, which seems to meet it in one point. But if you think of moving this line towards that one, then these two points just come together. So I should really count that as two points. And then it's two points. But now you say, okay, that was fine, but how about this line? It doesn't seem to meet it at all. However, you may or may not remember that I did a video about the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says that any polynomial in one variable of degree d has d roots if you count it with multiplicity. That's the case here, but the roots have become imaginary. One way to see that, the equation of the circle we drew before is x squared plus y squared equals 1. And if I now substitute y equals ax plus b, the equation of a line, then I can write this as a quadratic equation in x and y. This then y squared would be a squared x squared plus 2axb plus b squared. If I add an x squared plus x squared, then it's a squared plus 1x squared, and I've set that equal to 1 or sub subtract 1 and look for the roots, then that will have to have two roots because it's a polynomial of degree 2. So there are two points, they just happen to have imaginary coefficients. So that line is touching the circle twice. So that line I just have to imagine it. Touches the circle twice, but you imagine it. That's right. All right. So that's nice. Now, in the 19th century, this was well understood. Gauss proved the fundamental theorem of algebra. They knew that this should be true. They worked in the complex numbers. But they went a step further. If you think about this, what happens with this vertical line? Where does it touch the hyperbola? And the answer is it touches it at the point at infinity. If you continued these lines out, they would get closer and closer together. They would never meet, but you can imagine that there's a point out there at infinity. We have a tangency at infinity with these two lines, so that's a double intersection again. And what about this one? Here, these two go out, and if we had a line at infinity, as they imagined already in the mid-19th century, this thing would be tangent to the line at infinity. That's what happens when you move that line all the way up. In fact, when you look at equations and allow yourself to make complex complex changes of coordinates, all these figures look the same. There's no difference between a circle, hyperbola, parabola, 
in terms of just the equations. They're all degree two equations. And as I say, they're degree two because they meet a line in two points. Now I want to talk about tangencies of figures. This was a big deal in the 19th century too. So what do I mean by tangency? Here's the simplest tangency. You can see, if I think of a line in the space of lines, what would that mean? So let's take a point out here and think of all the lines through the point. So that's what I would mean by a line in the space of lines. And you can see that as I do this, there are two places where it's tangent. So that's a condition of degree two also. In the space of lines, this is a line. <laughs> this family of lines is a line. And that line meets the condition of tangency also in two points. So condition of tangency is an equation of degree two on the coordinates of this line. So that's another way that you can have degree two. So now let's talk about the first number, another two. Suppose I look at tangency of two circles. So two circles can be tangent, for example, this way. There are two tangent circles. They're just kissing each other. Kissing each other. They could kiss on the inside too, like this. And a line in the space of circles, what would that mean? Well, here's, here's how I draw a circle, but I could have other radii, right? I could put an R there, that would be the radius of the circle. Turns out if I think R bigger and smaller, that's a line in the space of circles. Here's one circle, I'm going to fix this circle, and I'm going to take another circle and change its radius. So I'm going to fix the center, the center here is zero, zero, and I'm going to change the radius and watch it, and it expands, and at a certain point it becomes tangent to this circle, and then it stops being tangent afterwards. After a while, there'll be a circle which has this as its center, which looks like this, and is tangent up here. It has a second tangency, right? So in the space of circles, being tangent is a degree two condition. It happens twice. And it can't happen a third time. And it can't happen a third time, even over the complex numbers. You have to take my word for that. But we could work it out in equations, and then it would be easy. Here's another way degree plays a role. We saw that a line meets something of degree two in two points. How about two things of degree two? An ellipse and a circle both have degree two, and they can meet in four points. Two times two. And it's something called Bezout's theorem, a very important theorem in geometry. Etienne Bezout, I think. But didn't your two circles both have degree two? Yeah, these both have degree two, hmm. but they, and they look like they're meeting only in two points at a time. Oh, they're meeting, so that's meeting, but, not tangenting, yeah. That's right. Yeah. But even so, these circles look like they're meeting only in two points, right? But this is a case like this, these lines. They're, they're, if we do it in equations, and we could parameterize the circle and substitute the equation of the other circle in it, then we'd get an equation of degree four, and it would have four roots. Okay. So just as we computed here, a degree two, we'd have four roots. So over the complex numbers, they always have four intersections counted with multiplicity, two conics. And that's a case of Bezout's theorem. If you have a bunch of conditions of degree d, where you expect d solutions from a line, but if you have two of them, then they meet in d squared points. If you have three of them meeting in a three-dimensional space, like three spheres would, meet in eight points over the complex numbers. So that's a general fact. So how many circles are there? What is the space of circles like? So if you think of circles, there are really three numbers that are important. There's the center, let's say the point AB, and there's the radius. The equation x minus a squared plus x minus b squared equals r squared. So that's the equation of a general circle. And there are three numbers involved. So the space of circles is a three-dimensional space. Now, if you have a three-dimensional space and you have conditions which are satisfied by a some, somewhere on a line, let's say two on a line, those are quadratic conditions, then Bezout's theorem tells you if you have three such conditions, there ought to be three points of intersection. So Bezout interpreted that funny way, says there should be two times two times two, eight circles that fulfill all of three degree two conditions, like being tangent to a given circle. So we take three circles, so here's one, and here's one, and here's one. If you worked over the complex numbers, you could do it with any three circles in the plane you wanted. And now let's see if we can draw eight circles tangent to all of them. And the trick is that a tangent circle can be outside or tangent inside. So I have two different ways of being tangency and three circles. So 
2 times 2 times 2 seems very reasonable. So here's a circle that's inside all of them. Here's a circle that's outside, whoops, outside all of them. These are Eisenbud circles. You've, you've had Eisenbud 17 gone, so... We're used to lack of precision, yeah. <laughs> yes. So let's see if we can draw one that's inside this and outside those two. Well, no problem. Here's one that's inside that and outside those two. And I can do the same thing over here, clearly. Something like this, or something like this. Let's see, so I have inside all of them, inside the three and outside the others. Yeah. What am I missing? I'm missing one that's... There's going to be one there, isn't there? There's going to be oh, one... On, that's the same circle. No, one. No, that's no, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. So there's one here, touching all three. So we now have the counting game. Let's see, there's, there's one in here. We're missing this one, and this one. That's eight. Ah, we got it. So we got eight circles tangent to the three given circles. Okay, so that's the beginning of the story, the two and the eight. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Maybe this is two videos, I'm not sure. <laughs> all right, so in the middle of the 19th century, people got more ambitious, and they said, let's do the same thing with conics. Why just circles? The circle story is very old. I don't know who did it first, but maybe Apollonius or somebody like that. But with conics, it's more complicated, but this was a problem proposed by Jakob Steiner in 1848. He said, let's try this with conics, but how many conditions do we need for conics? So we need to, to see how many parameters a conic depends on. You can write it always as ax squared plus by squared plus cx plus dy plus a constant e. One, two, three, four, five. So it's a five-dimensional space of conics. So we need five conditions. Well, okay, we could have tangent to a line. That might be interesting, but why not tangent to conics? So if we, once again, conics tangent to a conic is co-dimension one. It's, it's given by one equation in the coefficients of the conic. If I fix a given conic, like a circle, then there'll be a four-dimensional family tangent to this conic. If I fix a second conic, maybe that one, a parabola, there'll be a three-dimensional family tangent to both. If I fix a third, maybe it's a hyperbola somewhere, there'll be a two-dimensional family tangent to all three. And if I fix two more, it should be just a finite set of conics tangent to all of them. So let's see if we can count how many. So we have to see what the degree of the condition is to ta of tangency. And with conic, with circles, I could draw it for you. With conics, it's much harder. And in fact, it's a condition of degree 6. Each of these five conditions is of degree 6. So Bezu's theorem says that five conditions of degree 6 should have solutions, which are 6 to the fifth power, and which is 7776, seven, the last time I looked. So... Steiner said, okay, this, there should be that many conics tangent to five given conics. So just like you did the eight circles for me, you could do the same thing now with your conics, drawing other conics, right? and you could draw seven, 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 Well, six that's what them. Steiner thought, but he was wrong. And the Bezu's theorem doesn't work so well in this case. This was discovered pretty soon afterward and first published by... Michel Schall, the right answer is not 7776, but 3264. So you could draw, in principle, 3264 conics tangent to five, these five given conics. They, those, those new ones you would draw in in red pen for me, which, right. I, which I won't ask you to do. It would, because, they, they, oh, I could draw it just by filling the plane with red. You couldn't, you would never see the conics. But they would be... All different sorts of conics. There might be like a thousand circles yeah, and that's twenty right. parabolas. And there might well, right? Right, and there and there's well. and you don't know what that mixture necessarily would be. I do not. But it, remember, in the in the in the setting in which these guys worked, there's no difference between parabolas and hyperbolas at all. They all look like equations like this. There's coefficients just just are different e coefficients. There are thirty two sixty four five tuples of numbers a b c d e, which satisfy the condition. That's what they, that's what Shaw proved I mean, or as, claimed. I mean, as I, as I look at that now, yeah. it's almost hard for me to imagine one conic that would manage to tangent all of them. Like, Well, that's because there's, there's complex numbers involved, right? So, so you couldn't draw them, and even if you knew them, you couldn't draw them. 
on, on the my real plane, that's right. Yeah. So it was a question for a long time whether there is any configuration of the five conics which allows all 3264 conics to be real. And the answer is yes, uh, could be real, could be all real. Oh, wow. Has that been... And there are pictures. There yes. are pictures of them. Yes. Again, you can't draw all 3264. It just fills the plane with black. Right. But you can draw a few hundred at a time and explain how they fit together. And this was done by a man named Frank Sotile. That's quite recent. So Sotile has specialized in this quest of realizing these funny configurations over the real numbers in different ways. It was quite a come down from the hope of 7776 <laughs> to the reality of... That's the right. Yeah. So where did the other ones go? Yeah. Right? And there's a good answer to that. So when you write down the, the five equations that uh, give the conditions of tangency, unfortunately they have some spurious solutions. And the reason is very simple, and I could even demonstrate it with the eight circles, although it doesn't play a role there. Circles are circles, you know what they are, they're round. But conics, as I said, they come in lots of shapes, and if you let the Equations degenerate a little bit. If you take b equals c equals d equals e equals zero, you get x squared equals zero. And that's the equation of a double line. So the double lines could be in there. And if you think about it, what is the condition of tangency? It's that it, where it touches, it touches twice. But a double line touches twice wherever it touches. Right? There's it's two lines there, so it's, it's tangent. And how many double lines are there? Not just finitely many, but a whole plane form. Because, you know, you can draw one parameter family of lines through a point. You can move the point through a two parameter family of lines. So there's a whole surface of lines. So when you intersected those five conditions of degree six, you got not finitely many solutions, but a surface of double lines, plus the solutions you really wanted. And shall had to figure out how to remove the surface and write down the conditions without the surface. He got the right answer by methods which are not rigorous by our standards. And probably the first rigorous uh, demonstration of this number is due to Fulton and McPherson in the 1970s. So it took a long time to get this right. Well, a long time to get it rigorous. He got it right. That's true. <laughs> he got it right. Actually, there were a lot of numbers computed by by shady methods in the 19th century, and they've all been right. So they were pretty smart Who needs about what they did, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Nowadays, we just compute on the computer, we can see. And in fact, numerically, you can find the 3264 lines in a second or so on a fast machine, but it's not quite a proof. Tell me about your special relationship to number 3264. You've used it? Yes, I have. Joe Harris and I wrote a book on this subject, which is called Intersection Theory. And the book is called 3264 and all that. And there's the picture of the eight circles tangent to three given circles on the cover. And we explain a real proof of the case of the conics somewhere in here. Let's see. There are some conics. I wonder if I have a theorem somewhere in this chapter. We called it the five conic problem. And uh, here it is as a keynote problem. How many conics are tangent to five? And another similar problem given 11 general points in the plane. How many rational cortic curves <laughs> contain them all? And there you can multiply these problems as long as you like. They're mostly good for sharpening your tools for more serious things. But problems like this are all over the place in mathematical physics today. In general, this whole theory of what, what are called excess intersections, which Fulton and McPherson made precise in the mathematical sense, play an enormously important role in mathematics and physics. So that's the story of, of 8, 3264, and 7776. Crude, simple-minded way. And it turns out to be that you're really pretty close for big numbers. So let's, let's do a little calculation. One of the most famous theorems in number theory is the prime number theorem.